I'm Maria Farrell. I'm a, on the board of the Open Rights Group, and um, I am going to be uh, moderating our discussion today on um, online abuse and uh, what we do about it, um, where the limits of one person's free speech ends and another person's uh, free speech begins. So we have two fantastic speakers today. Uh, first of all, we have um, Nigat Dad, who is the executive director of the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan. Um, she is a a lawyer, an activist, um, she's won all sorts of uh, well-deserved awards, um, including, let me see, I'll, I'll just pick one or two at random here, the Atlantic Council Freedom Award, um, and she's a 2017 TED Global Fellow. Uh, she is an all-round activist and superstar. Um, we also have Asmina Drodia, another activist and superstar. She works with Amnesty, and she has recently put together um, an incredibly... Um, quite shocking, actually, report on online abuse um, as it affects women and public figures in UK political life. Um, so we're going to be talking about both of those um, uh, sort of areas, basically freedom of speech issues in Pakistan, in the UK more broadly. Um, and really, we're going to try and focus on what are the, um, what, what is the stuff we agree on? How do we deal with really pretty obvious abuse? and what are the um, solutions um, that are open to us to deal with that. So you guys uh, in Amnesty put out a report a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. and it was about UK uh, MPs and women in public life. Um, I, I mean, I've been, in the, I've been kicking around for a while, and I was shocked. Um, it really kind of blew my socks off a little bit, and not in a good way. Uh, so maybe you could just give us a few of the greatest hits of that. Um, and also, like name names. Let's hear about the individuals and how it affects them and what they've told you. Because it's a terrific report. It does both quantitative and qualitative research. And I think both they're, they're equally um, uh, hard hitting. Is this on? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, hi. Um, so, yes, earlier this year, um, Amnesty worked with a data scientist um, to basically create an algorithm to detect online abuse against women MPs in the UK. So we use a social listening tool called Crimson Hexagon to download about a million tweets between January 1st and uh, to June 8th, which was when the snap election um, was called in the, uh, happened in the UK. Um, and basically what we did is we worked with this data scientist to develop an algorithm using machine learning and a sentiment analysis. Um, we, as the team, uh, a bunch of us actually manually labeled some tweets so that we could give the, you know, the machine some manually labeled tweets to understand what was abusive and what isn't, um, which in itself we can get to later if you want to talk about algorithms. Um, and we ran, we ran the, the sentiment analysis, and like you said, the, this, uh, the, uh, the findings were... They weren't surprising, but they were absolutely shocking. So what we found was that, first of all, Diane Abbott, who many of you will know is the Shadow Home Secretary and is also the first black woman MP in Westminster, in the, in the six weeks in the run-up to the election, she alone received almost half of all of the abuse that women MPs in total that are active on Twitter received. Um, so she received 45%. And I think when you looked at the wider period of analysis, it was at about 32%. So that in itself was shocking. And I think the number of abusive tweets that she received was more, combined, was more than the Scottish National Party and Conservative National Party women MPs combined. So it was just astronomical. Um, and it was interesting because she had talked about it in the press a little bit. Um, and anecdotally, she had said that she received a lot of abuse, but I think the, the analysis really spoke to her, spoke to her words. Um, the second finding was that because Diane Abbott's data kind of skewed everything so much, even when you take her out of the equation, black and Asian women MPs experience 35% more abuse than white women MPs. Um, so I think what the findings show is just how intersectional online abuse is, and that when you are women with multiple or intersecting identities, you are going to face more abuse because you are not just facing abuse on the basis of your gender, but on the basis of your religion, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. And then I think the last main finding is it's incredibly important to highlight the intersectional nature of abuse, but we also found that there were 25,000 abusive tweets sent to women MPs in the entire period of analysis of six months. And in the top five women, um, there were the top three largest political parties are represented. So you had women from the SNP, from Labour, and from the Conservative Party. So we know that you know, women from all political parties are experiencing this. So it's not immune to certain women. It's, it's, it's widespread, but it has a particular effect on um, women of color, women with intersecting identities. 
Thanks very much, Asmina. So, Nigat, so you have been doing work, obviously, in Pakistan and uh, the digital rights organisation there. You set up a helpline about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a bit about what kind of, what kind of people have you had coming to you? What, you know, what do they regard as abuse? And yeah, so uh, um, I, uh, I actually started organization, Nonprofit Digital Rights Foundation in 2012. And since then, um, we have been receiving a lot of uh, complaints from younger women and girls about online harassment and abuse. And uh, really had no idea how to deal with that because uh, we had no legislation. And unfortunately, when we have legislation now, which was enacted a year ago, that was very, very draconian in the name of protecting women and girls uh, on, uh, in the, uh, on the internet. That uh, law was basically uh, mostly to curtail free speech and uh, you know uh, the the right to privacy. Uh, so uh, the law is there, but then we saw that uh, the law enforcement isn't doing much. Uh, instead, they were abusing the law that that they enacted mm -hmm. in the name of protecting women and girls. So we thought that why not to address this issue the way we can, and we started a helpline with a very small budget. And uh, the the helpline basically uh, deals with the call of women who are and the uh, and the abuse the online harassment and abuse in Pakistan is it's it's maybe the same as the women around the world is facing but the consequences are different according to the context and the culture that we have uh, so, for instance, uh, the fake profile on Facebook or even not even the nude photo on Facebook, but just the normal photo of a woman uh, who is living in uh, in a very uh, conservative area of Khyber Pakhtun or Balochistan, uh, that photo or that fake profile can put her life at risk because the so-called honor killings that are going on in Pakistan and how now technology and social media is playing its role. So uh, we started getting these com complaints. Uh, we started the helpline last year in uh, December 2016. And the kind of complaints that we are receiving is mostly about uh, the, um, uh, the non-consensual uh, use of uh, uh, intimate images, which here people normally call it revenge porn. I don't call it revenge porn. Uh, and, um, and also about fake profiles and, and mostly, you know, how the social media platform, and Facebook is very famous. Mostly people think in Pakistan that Facebook is the entire internet. Um, <laughs> And uh, Facebook is very, is very famous, and mostly people are using. And so most of the harassment that happens is on this platform. Uh, so anything related to Facebook, the abuse or a privacy breach or fake profiles. Uh, uh, so people reach out to us that Facebook is not taking down the content that we are reporting to them, or their reporting mechanisms are really not responsive. So these are the complaints. These these are kind of complaints that we receive. So then what happens? Do you, when you get a complaint like that, do you sort of put them all together and go and knock on Facebook's door and say, hey, you didn't answer? So we sometimes respond very quickly. Uh, to, so it's not always to reach out to the company or to the law enforcement. Sometimes there is, there is uh, an aspect of mental health as well. So mostly women, when they call us, they are they frantically looking for the solution. And sometimes when there is a risk to their life, they are crying and, you know, like asking for help. So we have a counselor who looks in to that part, but also the digital safety part. So the users online, they even don't know their, you know, like really basic online safety precautions. Or if they are on social media platform, they don't know the, their privacy settings or strong password, really, really basic stuff. So I think the, so we respond to that, but also uh, we also talk to the social media companies as well that where they are, their policies are lacking, where they are not responding, where, for instance, one thing that we found that mostly abuse that is happening in Balochistan, Sindh, or, or Punjab, or KPK, it's in the regional language. And Facebook doesn't recognize that abuse because it's uh, not in English. So we, 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 we told them that this is the gap. So they started looking into it, but still it's a, I think it's a long way to go for social media platforms to you know, sort of address these issues. Right, yeah. right. Um, Asmina, I mean, how, what would you classify as abuse? Isn't that a fun question? Um, so I think there, it's, it's difficult, and I'm going to use the word gray area so many times in the next 45 minutes. Um, so we're sort of looking at the range of violence and abuse, um, and I think there's different forms that it can take. Um, so obviously there's direct and indirect threats of violence. There is non-consensual uploading of mm -hmm. private or sexual images. There's doxing. 
there is misogynistic, racist comments. Um, but I think the important part is we, we know that all of this is exist, that it happens. And I think it's important to look at the impact of that. And that's what the research that we did on, on the Twitter abuse really showed was that, of course, we have the hard data, and then you speak to the female MPs that are experiencing this. And you know, I sat down and had pretty intimate conversations with both Diane Abbott and a former SNP um, MP named Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh. And what's so clear is a the silencing effect of online abuse, and b the psychological toll and the psychological impact, which I think is so under researched and under misunderstood. Um, and it's just, I think, when you look at abuse and the varying types of it, the that the silencing impact comes at all levels. So, you know, I interviewed Nicola Sturgeon and she told me about the silencing impact that online abuse can have. And I've also spoken to 18 year old young girls who, you know, or young women who were on Twitter and tweeted for the first time and they had 50 men tell them to, or I don't know, some, they said that it was all men, but we don't know in some instances they're anonymous accounts. But they had 50 users basically tell them to, you know, shut up, love, go back to the kitchen, mm. you know, you know go make a cup of tea, you know, and you're basically, they had the exact same reaction about silencing. She said, I don't want to go and tweet anymore. Like, if this is the reaction I'm going to get. So I think abuse is incredibly subjective. Um, it's hard. There's great, there's great areas, and which is why it requires a varying levels of response and responsibility by social media companies, as well as obligations by, by governments when it becomes criminal. And so, I mean, I'm curious about the effects. So, um, you know, you... I think you both probably have, have lots of lots of stories you could tell. Um, one of the things that you that, that people are often told, and particularly women, when they report these sorts of things to the police, is "oh, just turn off," right? Which is sort of like the online equivalent of "just report all that harassment; it'll go away." So I'm just wondering, what I mean, are you? Do you find that people are that uh, various? You know, that the re response is improving, um, or is it? Let me put it another way. Um, one of the things we always talk about is education, education, education. You know, this comes from sexism and patriarchy and misogyny more broadly. Do you think there is something different in terms of volume or intensity of the abuse that women are, and um, you know, other minorities, people of colour, um, people of different you know, sexual identities are experiencing online? Is there something new about this? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely different in the way that it can prol proliferate so quickly. So one person can, you know, send you abuse online and then all of a sudden that can be retweeted or shared and all of a sudden it's hundreds of people. It's also very difficult sometimes to take down abuse. So it is, it is different. Um, I think this idea that you can just turn off and this distinction that people are making between online and offline realities is becoming less and less clear um, because... I know myself how, how my online personality is so much linked to me you know, offline and my identity offline. Um, and absolutely, it's, education is key. So it's, I think a lot of women's rights groups in the UK are really pushing for sex and relationships education here to look at online abuse and to look at you know, what is online abuse? What is the impact of it? You know, what does your comment online that you think may, be, may not really be harmful? What, is, what, what actual impact does it have? Um, and really rooting this whole idea. This didn't come out of nowhere. We didn't just wake up one day and women started experiencing abuse online. This is absolutely an, ex you know, an extension and a manifestation of existing discrimination and violence against women offline. Um, so we need to sort of tackle those negative gender stereotypes. It's, it's a culture shift. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I would say, I mean, com coming from Pakistan, it's like the deep-rooted patriarchy plays a lot of role, and it's the same mindset which you sort of, you know, the, the mindset which is which harasses or abuses women in the offline spaces, and abuse is very common in Pakistan in, in public spaces and in in our work, at our workplaces, and even sometimes starting from your own home. Uh, the same mindset mindset has shifted to the online spaces, and it's the I I, I see that. Uh, it's actually education, of course, is the key. But I also feel that you know the the there there is a lot of catch up needs to be done by the women rights organizations or law enforcement or even the government who think that the virtual abuse not it's it's not even a form of violence. They think it's happening on internet. It will stay on internet. You know, it has nothing to do with the offline space. And I think it's very like it's very important for them to understand that there is a it it is strongly connected with the offline spaces as well. Right. So I suppose one of the things I'm thinking is, you know, we thought the internet was going to be this massive, you know, liberating technology, and it was going to give people voices who didn't have them, 
um, and give us you know, access to all sorts of alternative opinions, news, give people just channels that were not the official channels. And, and I know you got your start you know, in campaigning for open access, ac or access to the open internet, so the non-Facebook internet, the actual internet. And, and I know I've been in this thing for 20 years, and we thought it was going to be fantastic. You know, um, and, and I think most of us still do in our heart of hearts, but I do find myself asking myself, like, where did it all go so horribly wrong? Uh, I, I guess uh, when I started working on open access to internet, and still, I mean, I'm an, a staunch advocate of open access to internet, uh, and internet in Pakistan, as I see, uh, has given a lot of space to marginalized communities, the sexual minorities, the religious minorities, uh, women um, in general, the, the space that they don't don't find in the physical space, uh, they found that space in the off in the in, on the internet. But I I think that the the uh, the patriarchy also found its way to, uh, on internet, and uh, they they you know like the people who basically abuse uh, different communities, especially marginalized ones, they uh, use this. Um, what 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 should I say? It's like the the principle of free speech to silence marginalized communities. So when you say that it's an abuse, they say it's my free speech. But then you know, like, and that that's why I would again say it's a, it's a very gray area, and you know, really, I think need to be more uh, you know like discussed and debatable that how we can find you know like how we can draw the line between an abuse and a free speech, and it's. Internet is becoming really, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's becoming very toxic for women in Pakistan. I can yeah. see why, yeah. Yeah, um, it's funny, we, you know, at the Open Rights Group, we're a freedom of expression and digital rights organization. So this is something we really, you know, it's really close to our hearts is, is the conflict between, you know, the minority freedom of speech and majority freedom of speech and when one person's freedoms encroach on that of another. Um, but one of the things that really struck me as Mina reading your report, and you were very careful to say this is something that reaches across all political parties, but I'm not quite sure it does. In that, so <laughs> I'm going to quote some of your data back at you, but but I'm, uh, I'm um, not in a way that I hope is 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 uh, is, um, is going to hijack the discussion in any way. Um, so. When I look at a lot of this stuff, it almost seems to follow the 80-20 rule in that lots of this online abuse is coming from the right of the political spectrum. I mean, I sort of think we have to call a spade a spade, you know, in that, and, and there are, we've got all manner of political views represented in this room. But when I look at your, uh, the data that says, you know, who were the, the sort of the top five women um, receiving online abuse mm -hmm. um, in the first six months of this year and then in the six weeks running up to the election... For the first six months of the year, number one, Diane Abbott. Uh, she got 10 times more abuse than anyone else. But then underneath her, you have Joanne Cherry, SNP, Emily Thornberry, Labour, Jess Phillips, Labour, and Anna Soubry, Conservative. And I know that Anna Soubry was getting abuse online, not because she's a Conservative, but because she opposes Brexit. So, you know, I'm kind of, I'm thinking that's, that's basically all, all of them, you know, there's a relatively right of the spectrum. And then when you look at the, the, the six weeks before the election, the only conservative woman who was receiving a significant amount of abuse was um, Amber Rudd, and that is because she was being the proxy for the Prime Minister and going on television. If you go on television, you get a massive spike in your online abuse. So, so here's my question to you, really, <laughs> after giving you all of your data back, but is, you know, how can we have a conversation about the fact that lots of this is coming from fairly right, uh, hard right of the spectrum, and also potentially being automated. I mean, I think that's a bit of an assumption to, th to say where it's coming from. Um, so we tried to do a network analysis, and we just kind of didn't have enough time or resources. It was a very small pilot project. But I think one of the things is we don't necessarily know where the abuse is coming from, and we don't know exactly why women are being targeted. Um, so I think... It, it's, yeah, I mean, I agree. Obviously, the, the stats show that women in you know, the Labour Party were, were in the top five in both instances, and there were more women that were experiencing abuse. But since we don't know where the abuse is coming from, we can't necessarily attribute it to the far right, and we can't say that they are experiencing more abuse because they are women in Labour. I think that's the first thing. But at the same time, you know, if you want to make assumptions, then that, you, know, you would assume that because there's a trend there. I think it's... I mean, you know... As a, as a human rights organization, I think our, we're trying to look at this from the fact that it affects women 
across the board. Um, and you know, obviously there's different political parties and we don't want to make it about political party infighting. This isn't about labor receiving more abuse or conservative women receiving more abuse you know, in comparison. Obviously we did that because that's what the stats show and we wanted to align a political party with them. But the point of the research was to just really, we didn't know what the findings would be and then we got them and we were like, oh, okay, that's, that's very, very interesting. Um, and I think the main finding is the intersectional nature of the abuse. I think that for me stands out more than the fact that you know, la labor women received more because when you look at the stats, they were just overwhelmingly in favor of women of color receiving more abuse. So I think it's, you know, there is, there is a political party analysis to be made, but without knowing who the perpetrators are and without actually going and pouring over every single abusive tweet that was sent to each women MP in each political party, it's a bit difficult to ascertain where it's coming from and what, why they were being targeted. Was Diane Abbott being targeted because she's in labor? Or was she being targeted because she's a black woman MP? Yeah, it's a, thank you. That's a really good clarification. Um, so, um, what were the other things we wanted to cover before we open it up for questions? Um, so, I suppose when so when we look at this issue, we you know we're told there's there's sort of the number of potential remedies or partial remedies, and so there's education, there's um, sort of takedown by the social media platforms, there is um, criminal legislation, um, and what else? I'm sure I'm missing something. Um, People not being assholes. Mm -hmm. How about that one? <laughs> Let's try that one. But so, um, what are your thoughts, um, particularly you, Nagat, from um, you know what you've seen in Pakistan? What's working and what's what needs a bit more time or effort? Yeah, uh, I think uh, legislations and policies are important. But I think as an activist, my lesson learned is that do not uh, you know uh, do not demand a law. To tackle abuse, because uh, because governments always use uh, you know such demands for their own purposes, and that's what I saw that uh, uh, the Pakistani government you know made uh, this legislation in the name of protecting women and girls. It didn't protect any woman or girl so far. The legislation was made last year. Uh, up till now, there are like number of social media activists and political activists who are arrested in the same legislation, but not a single case of women who reported it to the law enforcement uh, has been resolved. And uh, there is there are a couple of cases which are um, which are um, you know uh, pending before the court for more than a year now. Uh, so that's one lesson learned. But I I see that constantly you know like. Um, pressurizing these social media companies who are making you know like who are making money out of our data and it's very important to remind them again and again that these platforms are for internet users you know and uh, and if you know, and that and they are there because we because we are on their platforms uh, and you know like uh, so that's like about the social media companies and you know like keep keep pushing them uh, but also look at the you know like uh, tread like ways in which you can address the issues in your own context. Uh, we started the helpline uh, so far. Uh, um, um, we started in December 2016. Up till now, we have received 1,000 complaints on our uh, helpline. And uh, among those, we re referred 300 to the uh, law enforcement and uh, and few hundreds to the uh, to the social media companies and i think uh, it's not only so the people who are facing this abuse they at least have a space to talk about this they can get support there are so many women who just uh, you know face this in silence and they cannot even get support and that's the culture we have women cannot turn towards their families in pakistan about you know uh, talking about the uh, their intimate images being disseminated uh, uh, without their consent, because at first place, families don't know about their relationships. So, you know, that's, again, a very cultural issue, uh, but that's how we sort of, you know, decided to start the helpline. May, it might not work for other jurisdictions, but it's working well for uh, for Pakistan. I won't say that we are addressing this um, uh, 100%, but uh, I think we, at least we have something, instead of, you know, a tool or app, somebody, a white dude making in the, you know, Silicon Valley for a brown woman in Pakistan, it won't work for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very, it's, it was very important for us to, uh, to find some, you know, uh, really localized solution. Um, 
Yeah, but also one interesting thing that we found that we started the helpline for women and marginalized communities, but we ended up getting calls from men as well. So there are like 37 calls, 37% uh, calls are by men uh, in, in last six months. And mostly, uh, mostly men are calling on behalf of the woman. So either they are their family member, either they are friend or colleague. And these women are even, even not comfortable calling on the helpline. There is this much you know, fear of talking to someone. So I think there are so many taboos that we are breaking, you know, not only giving the solution, but having a helpline in, in fact is actually, you know, breaking the stereotype. Um, and it might seem very harmless, uh, you know, initiative, but we also receive lots of threats. Uh, as in, oh, you are actually, you know, re ruining the uh, uh, Islamic uh, culture and values while telling women that how they can be safe online uh, and their point of view is that first place women shouldn't be online. So. Well, that's, a, that's another mountain to climb, isn't it? <laughs> um, just before we go to the audience for questions, Asmina, um, I was just wondering about some of the tools that we have for reporting can also be used um, can be turned on people and, and quell their freedom of speech. I'm just thinking of this mad example that just popped into my head, um, which wasn't a serious one, but um, there was a march organised in Birmingham a few weeks ago about a political issue, and um, people who were opposed to the politics of that started um, reporting the Facebook page that was organising it as abusive. And the page kept going up, going down, going up, going down. Um, and so, so the people who were sort of trying to potentially do something perfectly within their rights found that the abuse policies were being um, used against them. And I'm wondering, is, you know, that sort of, it, it's, it, it's the risk we run, isn't it? In, in that trying to do something about abuse, we can shut down legitimate free speech. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, that's the danger, that's the gray area, is that in, in our response and in the solutions, how are we ensuring that we're not restricting free speech and creating another set of problems for ourselves? Um, so I, I do think with social media companies and their policies, I mean, you know, broad strokes overall, they seem to have policies that are, you know, decent <laughs> on abuse, hateful conduct, etc. But so much of it is about enforcement and then about transparency. Yeah. So... I, you know, in, in response to the Twitter analysis, um, Twitter's response was, since last July, we have responded to 10 times the amount of abuse, uh, or sorry, the 10 times, 10 times the amount of reports uh, around abuse than we did this time last year. I have no idea what that means because I don't know how many reports of abuse they responded to last year because there's no transparency about how many reports they get and most importantly, how they deal with it. So it, until we have that, until we understand, we all know that this is a problem. You have small bits of research coming out here and there talking about it, giving, trying to give numbers to it. But it, we need to understand the scale and the nature of the problem. We need to understand if these policies are actually effective. If, you know, what, how, how are moderators being trained? How are they understanding these different contexts that Nikha is talking about? How, you know, how many moderators are being resourced in um, countries and regions where they don't speak English? We don't know any of this, and when you don't know any of that, it becomes increasingly difficult to try and tackle the problem and, and the solution. And then I think the fear is then you try and come up with broad stroke responses that could then, you know, um, unfortunately just have the opposite effect of what we want to achieve, which is end up restricting freedom of expression. Um, so in that case of, uh, you know, you're saying pages being reported, I've talked to women who are journalists or uh, who have a public platform who constantly get shut down by people that are trying to silence them. And one of the ways to do that is by just having multiple people um, or, you know, perpetrators of abuse flag their page as abusive. So what, what are the policies? Or how many times does it take an account to be flagged mm -hmm. as abusive for it to be taken down? I don't know. So you know what I mean? So I think there's so much, um, there's so much to be understood. And then once we kind of un can understand what, what's happening and how these policies are actually being implemented, then we can come up with much more concrete solutions that I think can minimize the risk of um, you know, rep repressing speech instead of trying to promote the speech of the individuals that are being silenced and taken off these platforms. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, just add to this, uh, if you look at the um, social media uh, companies' uh, transparency reports, uh, so um, uh, last year when Facebook released their report, um, at the, the last year, the first six months report, um, I looked into the report and uh, it says uh, this much content has been taken down because it was anti-state. And I was like, how Facebook will determine what is anti-state in Pakistan? It's such a broad term. And, uh, and then there, were, there, there was another um, 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 
another mention that uh, this ma the, the, so these many pages has been taken down or the user's data in the name of blasphemy so these are really you know uh, the 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 kind of uh, requests that they receive from government how many re i mean they say that we have responded to these many uh, these many uh, uh, requests by the government but uh, but what about the uh, users you know how many how, how many users from from one country uh, has been asking them to you know uh, take down the content which is which they think is abuse and harassment so that that's that that that's the space where i feel that the transparency is not there and they are answerable to their users right right and so this is the problem we have with what is effectively civic space but being in private ownership yeah. and control yeah. got it Okay, so with some questions. Yes, I, you gentlemen in the front I want to know, but this gentleman in the check shirt first. And one for, uh, Asmina, the machine learning model you talked about sounds really useful. Um, the, it, would it be possible to... The, yeah, the machine Sorry, learning model. Yeah. <laughs> would it be possible to... I know how laborious it is doing the labelling process. Uh, would it be possible to open source the, the data set that you use? So yeah. We can build stuff. We can repeat it. Are you collecting comments? Or? Um, actually, no. no. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is actually a plan that we have talked about with the data scientists um, and some of their partners. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is, like I said, it was a, it was a pilot project. Um, you know, we did it over a few weeks. Uh, we manually labeled a statistically relevant sample of the data. Um, but I think it would be fantastic to try and create this sort of gold standard of algorithms that could help us understand and detect abuse, which will then you know, help us understand the patterns and who's experiencing the abuse, from whom, are there peaks with the offline you know, um, world. So yeah, I think that's something that we've been looking into. Um, maybe we can have a chat later, because we are speaking with different data scientists that are um, actually, we had tons of emails after we published from different machine learning specialists about how to collaborate and take this initiative further. And I think what would also help you would be if Twitter were to actually um, respond to your repeated requests to provide, help you provide you with the full data set, which I know they... Yeah, so we did make repeated requests to Twitter for the data set, uh, the full data set, because when you use um, a social listening tool like Crimson Hexagon, you don't receive or you don't get any tweets that are deleted or any tweets from accounts that have been suspended um, or have since left Twitter, which one would assume if your tweets are being deleted, it probably means that you broke one of Twitter's you know, policies um, and so your, your tweet has been deleted because maybe it was abusive. So you know, we have to also take our numbers with a grain of salt because we don't actually have the comprehensive data set to, to go off of. Yeah. Now, this man up the front in the pale shirt. Yeah. I had a question regarding, you said, for example, in Pakistan, post on Facebook, we moved for blasphemy. I mean, there is a question there of which laws apply to which posts from which countries and which standards, because obviously, for example, Americans tend to uh, easily censor uh, nipples or breastfeeding or even arts with nipples. You've got, for example, blasphemy in Pakistan, which is not a crime in France. So which, to which standard and to which audience are post censor? censor? For example, the, the uh, censor, the Bless me, one. Will it just be removed from Facebook access from Pakistan? So, um, so first of all, blasphemy is a very problematic law in Pakistan. So most of the um, most of the activists they do not agree with the law, uh, and I won't go into the detail because I have to go back to Pakistan and <laughs> and, do, and, and do my work, uh, you know, safely. Uh, but uh, so that's where you know we are very confused because. Uh, anything, uh, uh, this is, if, if we look back into the cases that has happened, the blasphemy cases, those are really, uh, you know, uh, really not clear because the way they interpret blasphemy is very, is very complicated and different. And so we don't really don't know the, uh, how the authorities are, you know, what kind of complaints they are sending or requests they are sending to the Facebook and how Facebook interprets it's a blasphemy. So that's where the tra transparency is not there and we really don't know how they are taking taking down the, and how many pages they have taken down in the name of blasphemy. Thanks, Nika. Okay, so more questions. I see, yeah, uh, woman in the pale jacket right at the back there, would you mind? Thank you. Um, what's your view on men's role in fighting this misogynistic, racialized online abuse? And I just asked because I've noticed several men leaving the room during this conversation, some haven't returned, so I just wonder, do they not think this is relevant to them at all? Mm -hmm. 
So before I moved to the technology and human rights team, I spent six years in Amnesty's gender, sexuality, and identity um, program. So this is actually the most men I've ever seen at a conference um, because <laughs> I normally go to feminist conferences, so you're lucky if you have two people, two men in the room. Um, I mean, I think it's the same with any form of offline discrimination or violence or abuse against women. Obviously, you know, this isn't just about women solving the issue. We need everyone. It requires a cultural and societal shift. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to say that all men are perpetrators because I don't, I don't know that, but I know that there are some men that are perpetrators of abuse and violence against women. So obviously we need men and women and people of all genders on board to try and tackle this. And to, I think one of the ways to do that is to really help them understand everyone um, what the impact of online abuse is um, and the silencing effect, the psychological impact, and that their words on a keyboard that they're typing that they may think you know, does it, isn't really harmful is actually having a very serious impact on women's expression online. Um, so I think, you know, ways to do that are obviously there's ways to, you know, create solidarity. So um, when you see abuse against a woman online, for example, and if you're a man um, or a woman, it doesn't really matter, I think, but, you know, flag the abuse for them. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very taxing process to have to go and report your abuse and take the screenshot, you know, um, you know, if it's, you know, say something back if you feel like engaging with the person and you feel safe to do so. I think there's different ways, um, you know, let, you know, share, you know, articles. I mean, there's different ways that you can help women, if you're a man, um, tackle this, this, this issue, I think. Yeah, I would say that uh, um, I think it's, uh, it's there, there is, of course, a lack of uh, men solidarity in this debate, but also try to understand you know what women go through do not hijack the the this this fight you know like do not make us understand how it looks like to us because when this me too campaign was going on i saw a lot of men in pakistan was telling us what is abuse and harassment of women uh, to us <laughs> so so we feel that solidarity is important and your role as a bystander is very important uh, and uh, and I, I guess first, first listen to us uh, and then see what you can do uh, while supporting women who are already in this fight. Yeah, I would, yeah, ask. <laughs> And I think that that question hits something really important, which is this is a problem that is happening to a certain group of people and they have to do all of the work of the solution. Here's just a quote from um, Asmina's report. It's a woman MP um, talking about abuse. She says, on a practical level, the violent stuff and the death threats are just very time consuming. Um, there's a big process to go through on each occasion with the police and the House authorities. We did the House of Parliament. Uh, there's obviously extra security measures you have to put in place every time. And also if your kids see the tweets, it's the first art, it's the first time for new members of staff, you have to do reassurance. So it's all of that, like the, almost this emotional labour reassurance role on top of all of the admin, on top of the terror. So yeah, well, well put question. Um, sorry, now more questions. Uh, woman down here in the, the pail in front and then woman, uh, our person in the best over there. Yeah. Okay, my question is actually about sorry. the um, Me Too campaign and whether you've seen any um, issues online um, in Pakistan uh, about the backlash um, from, n not necessarily men, but it being seen as being given ammunition. Do you see what I mean? Uh, so the, I, I, I don't think there was a massive backlash, but one thing that I saw that a lot of women uh, found their voice you know, uh, yeah, and then uh, I, I mean, even on my on my Facebook and my Twitter timeline, I, I saw lots of my friends they were speaking speaking up about the abuse that they faced in their childhood, and I think that's massive in conservative culture where women do not speak about the abuse or harassment that they face, and I think that campaign uh, gave a lot of women, uh, you know, their voices and how they spoke up, and actually mainstream media covered it, so that was good. <laughs> Good. To get more voices in right here, right now, um, I'm going to put a bunch of three questions together. So um, if you, there's someone right behind you, the vest, brilliant. Um, and then we have a woman in a grey jumper down there. And who else do we have? Oh, man here with the red check shirt waiting. So. Hi. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm in Diana Abbott's constituency. 
And I think she's like a really good MP, and I noticed that she actually got more votes in the recent election than she had before. So despite the fact that there was all this abuse, she's actually really popular locally, right? Um, and democratically, therefore, she's like should be our MP, and she's wanted to be an MP, but she gets all this abuse that makes it look like people don't want her. And I'm really worried about this like false vision of democracy, that by getting all of this abuse, we're giving this impression that these women in, are wanted in politics, despite the fact that like the voters are saying the opposite thing. And as you said, that it's also particularly against women of color, and how is that gonna put women of color off entering into politics? Um, so actually my question is, do you think there should be specific rules on Twitter or on social media that protect women politicians um, or like restrict what people can say to them? Or on the flip side, would that just make it harder for people to engage in democracy and talk to those women? Um, you spoke about um, education being part of the solution. Um, I'd be really curious to hear what your wish list would be for a national curriculum um, and how you would go about teaching about abuse to children and young people. Hi. Um, my question is about um, how much effort do you think we should make in uh, people, to, to, to make people anti-fragile, uh, to, anti to make people more robust and being able to stand up for themselves against abuse. I mean, I know you said about, uh, you know, people are feeling now empowered to um, report stuff, but more along those kind of lines. Okay, so we've got three, three things there, really. Rules for protecting women MPs, um, education, what works, particularly with children, and also resilience training. Okay. Um, so for the first question around Diane Abbott, yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, it was quite interesting. I've, I've interviewed a few MPs, and when I asked them about the type of abuse that they've experienced, every single woman has hesitated because she does not want to deter other women from joining politics. And that is a fear that MPs have because they are like, if I speak out about this and they know how bad it is, then, then they might not join. And that is the last thing that I want. Um, so I think it, it's a sort of, it, it's hard for them because they want to speak out about it to help tackle the issue. But then at the same time, um, you know, Diane Abbott was, had said that she was in, incredibly worried about the impact that, you know, um, the, exposing the abuse that she faced would have on younger women of color entering politics um, or just, you know, d debating in the public sphere. Um, but hopefully one of the ways that we can use their, their voices and, and sort of coming out about their experiences is by using it to tackle the issue. So in terms of the, the specific um, rules for female politicians, um, I think that actually would be, I think that would actually be quite dangerous. Um, women politicians use, you know, social media platforms as a way to engage and debate and learn and share what they're doing, not just with their own constituencies, but also the wider public. They're very reliant on these platforms. Um, and when it comes to freedom of expression, scrutiny, you know, um, sort of criticism against public uh, politicians, you know, you're just going to be, uh, you're going to have a higher level and threshold of scrutiny because of their positions and power. I think what would help instead of having, specific, you know, sure you can get the blue tick on Twitter that gives you enhanced, um, you're, you're verified and gives you enhanced reporting. But I think what would help is when women MPs are experiencing abuse and they report it, something is actually done about it. So I interviewed in, uh, Lisa Nandy last, uh, last week and she said, you know, I said, do you report? And, well, I did once and I basically got a report back saying this is not abuse, even though, you know, I think it was a, I think it was a violent threat against her. So, you know, pretty, pretty clear on that sense. Um, so she, she's just like, I don't really do it anymore. It's not really worth it. You know, I have other things to do. <laughs> like, you know, I'm an MP. So I think instead of coming up with new rules and sort of protectionist measures, we need to start enforcing the existing rules and ensure that when, when abuse is being uh, reported, that it's actually been taken seriously and dealt with appropriately by either the company and or the police if it is you know, a criminal act. Uh, yeah, I would respond to the education question. I think that uh, uh, one thing you already mentioned that it should be part of our 
uh, curriculum, but also how it can, I mean, this is, this is actually something that I also wonder that how it can be more, uh, you know, e evolving because technology is also, you know, it's ever changing. It changes every day. It changes every day. So, uh, so this is one thing that I, I wonder, I mean, we haven't done anything in Pakistan as yet. And I feel this is, I'm not, I, and as an activist or non-profit organization, we cannot do everything also. This is the part of government's duty to look into, you know, to, to this issue as well and, and take it as a serious issue because that's where we see the gap that government is not seeing it as an issue that anything that is happening on internet is just, you know, is non-serious and entertainment. That's where, you know, yeah. So that, that, that's the kind of approach that we see coming from the government. And I'm going to take the resilience question, and I'm going to say I'm going to ask everyone in anyone in this room who has um, ever uh, received online a death threat, a rape threat, or a threat of assault. Put up your hand now. Look around, people. And it's not all women. So there's a lot of this going around, and we need to work on it. We need to wrap up. But I, there have been three people who are sitting here. You three individuals have had a lot of response and animation during this, and I would like you just to have the microphone to, um, to tell us anything you want to tell us about this session, because we've been dealing with some pretty dark stuff here, um, but every time I deal, have interactions with young, young activists, I find myself full, brimming with hope and humour, so I'm hoping you might have something to tell us that would help us wrap up here. Um, hi. Oh, is it on? <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing that I, that's, you know, very common when, whenever we talk about abuse is this phenomenon of victim blaming in any sort of <laughs> abuse. And like, um, and this isn't just necessarily like, you know, from the younger people, it's like a lot of older, really educated people with a lot of degrees. And, um, and these people kind of always hit you with silencing tactics, especially like, you know, I'm just gonna name my dad does it a lot. <laughs> and um, what I always get thrown at me is that I don't know enough, I'm young, and if I'm facing abuse, I should take myself out of that situation. But to be honest, if I'm facing it everywhere, where am I supposed to go? Like, there's not like, a vacuum that I can escape to. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this session by saying thank you to Nirav Dad, thank you to Azmin Adrodia, and, um, and thank you also to Pam Go Coburn for putting this together. And thank you for all of your questions and your time. Thank you.